we are embarking on a sermon series for April, of which I will do the first two sermons and Ben will do the last one. Um, we have coined, called to Cape Town, a phrase that some of you have heard before. Um, I would do the first two, as I said, exploring specifically Jeremiah 29. So if you want to work that into your devotional time, you could do that. Um, so we're going to read from Jeremiah 29 this morning. This is in preparation for our mission to Cape Town on the 1st to the 5th of May. This is still in preparation of us getting our hearts aligned to having God's understanding of the city we live in and our attitude towards Him and it and having a, a biblical perspective of how to live in it. Um, and obviously we don't see Cape Town as a mission station for five days, but Cape Town is our mission station. Cape Town is not a lifestyle destination. It is a mission station. To the believer, Cape Town is not a lifestyle destination. It is a mission station. And I can tell you this much, that following both either of those routes as a lifestyle destination or a mission station, Cape Town will cost you your life. The, the one has got momentary re rewards and suffering in the long run, and the other one has got suffering in the short term, but eternal rewards. Both is going to cost you your life. The one is worth it, and that is if we align to the fact that Cape Town is a mission station and not a lifestyle destination. Are you with me? So it's not only for those five days, but we believe that we, we're called here. If, if God has so led you to be here, most of us, I believe that's the case, God has led you to be here, then you're called here. And you should be here with God, on God's mission, for God's purposes, and nothing else. But Cape Town's got a way of luring us in to some other things. Um, and the same happened to those who were in Babylon, and we'll have a look into that. Um, but we will explore in the coming weeks why there is a great invitation to a calling for Christians to inhabit this city and to contend for the kingdom here. So, without further ado, let us read a bit. We're going to read Jeremiah 29, verse 4 to 11, and then we're going to work through a few things. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not, let, do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When the 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. So this is J Jeremiah writing to the exiles. Jeremiah is still part of those who is in, back in Jerusalem who haven't been carried off into exile. He's writing to those um, who were carried into exile like Daniel and lots of the other artisans and officials and king and um, yeah, whoever was in exile. He's writing on them to in, encouraging them on how they should view their time in exile, to be aware of the false prophets that is there in their midst and to know and be encouraged about God that has got good plans for Israel's future. To whom of you have anyone ever said or sent a message with Jeremiah uh, 29 verse 11 to 13? Have you ever received that as an encouragement? Have they ever added the piece just before that says after 70 years? No, probably not. Um, 
So well, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using the same method as what Jeremiah used throughout his ministry. Jeremiah is not only seen as a great prophet, but as a great theologian of the Old Testament. And he used a lot of the writings from the Torah and Psalms and other prophets. And he, he used those things when he wrote and he interpreted them as they are applicable to the people in his day. And that's what we should do with scripture as well, to understand what it really meant and how this might really apply to us. So he gave us that model, and therefore we know that's a scriptural, biblical model. And the Apostle Paul uses it in the same way you'll see just now. He uses what Jeremiah wrote and applies it in his context. And we'll do the same today. Because we have to do these things, we have to interpret these things in the right context so that they can actually have uh, impact on us in the right way and not the way that we sometimes make them out to be, to have. So the overview of what we're going to speak about, these are the three things we're going to speak about and that I want to pull from this um, text um, this morning. We're going to pull other stuff from the text next week, but we're going to speak about our identity as exiles. We're going to speak about the false prophets in Babylon, and we're going to speak about God's promises in God's time. Our identity as exiles, false prophets in Babylon, and God's promises in God's time. Is that our revival starts, Alice? <laughs> it's been revival the whole morning. <clears throat> so next week, there's, there's a few obvious things in here that we're not going to address today. We're going to specifically speak about how to live in Babylon next week. Um, and then he, he, we're going to use, we probably, I haven't worked out the whole thing, but we're probably going to use Daniel as an example along with what we read in Jeremiah 20 now. How do we now live? But uh, firstly, I'm, I'm going to speak about us being exiles. And some of you might have a question to start off with and say, but how can we relate to, how can you call us exiles and how is this applicable to us? Now, we'll see what the Apostle Paul did with this in Philippians 3 and, uh, and, and what Peter did with it in 1 Peter um, to understand how we should interpret our identity as exiles and to then put us into that story and to draw from that. So I think it's crucial for any believer to get this, to as part of your identity to understand that you are an exile. Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. For the Israelites, their citizenship was in Jerusalem. Their citizenship was in Jerusalem, and they eagerly awaited to be released from Babylonian captivity, someone to rescue them and to be brought back we have a different citizenship those who are born again our citizenship is not in our nationality it's not in israel it's not in anything other but with that we have a heavenly citizenship that's the nation that's the primary nation we belong to is those who've been called to have a citizenship in heaven that those who from now until forever is part of what the scripture now and here calls heaven, God's people, forever with him. Your citizenship is not South African primarily. It is first heaven. And so from, from that, if you, we read 1 Peter 2 verse 11, he says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, as foreigners and exiles, now by this time it's been uh, a well established established doctrine in the early church that we should view ourselves as exiles because remember they were under Roman rule so they understood what it was to be oppressed politically and also could, could easily relate to that and say well now we have a different understanding our view is not that we are oppressed because we want to go back to Jerusalem but we are oppressed and for the sake of the gospel um, we, we are persecuted and we await eternal redemption so 
Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. And we'll see how as foreigners and exiles, the temptations in Babylon is there to promote your sinful desires and to have the false prophets call them out to you and have you walk and fulfill a lot of these sinful desires. So that's something an exile should be wary of. So what does it mean to be an exile? To be an exile is to be bound to live in a place that's not your home and it's not like your home. Now, a mistake we can make living in Cape Town is because we should, as Eugene Peterson say, love the place God calls you to. You should hate its idols, but you should love what God made here. And that can get blurry sometimes. So um, we, sh we should have an anchor in our soul. And if you don't have it this morning, then contend with God and just make a note with God right now and say, God, this citizenship in heaven thing, I don't fully have. I don't fully grasp it. Because if you're not going to grasp that, if you're not going to have that settled in your soul, you're not going to feel comfortable to name yourself an exile. Because then where do you live? Where do you, where's home? Is home your mother's house? Or will home eventually become Cape Town? What's home? Now the home for the Christian is where we would be with him for eternity. Which is here called heaven. Now we know that heaven to Jerusalem will come down and we will be here with him for eternity that's going to be heaven it's going to be amazing I, I'm, I'm eagerly awaiting a sermon series on heaven because I do think we've got wrong views on it and that's often the reason we're not that excited for it but I can tell you we're not going to sit on clouds with harps for millions of years <laughs> it's going to look much more like it does right now with just a lot more glory and perfection and beauty and that's really what we all really want isn't it but more of that maybe later um but your citizenship is in heaven you need to anchor that in your heart i i want you to maybe you need to make a switch here to to call yourself an exile in this place but then not to feel abandoned by god or to feel you have no home but to understand that you do have a home but it's a different home from the moment you were born again you were born into a different family it's got a different home You've got a different home. You're a citizen in heaven. You're an exile here for now. I just find it interesting that they were exiles there and the message of Jeremiah was that you'd be there for 70 years. Oh, I'm not going to go into the reason why and all that. There's a nice story to it. But where will you be in 70 years from now? Where do you think you might be? pretty well be in 70 years from now. Rinske is smiling at me. <laughs> we might be home. <laughs> Most of us will be home. Maybe there'll be a small group of us still gathering here saying, do you remember the good days? And they said we won't make 70 years and we, we made 70 years. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. So I realize that many of us might not identify as exiles. So that's why I'm just pausing at this. I want to just want you to not just glance over that fact and wonder in your heart and mind, how do I relate with this? And then we continue with the message without you having really maybe made a knot in your ear to go deal with this. Because the rest might not make that much sense. If you aren't an exile, then how is this applicable to you? But an exile is to be bound to live in a place that's not your home and it's not like your home. And I think, you know, in a way, it's easier to experience this in Cape Town because Cape Town's not that homey. So you, you long for something that mo most of us in this congregation um, come from, come, does not come from the city. Who of you grew up in Cape Town? Hands up. That's not Cape Town. That's just... That, you come from Durbanville, Ben. <laughs> Cape Town. One, we've got two people who grew up here. Okay, I know m most of you, you're not from here. And you long for that again, you long for home. It's got bigger gardens and all that stuff. And over the next few weeks, I'd like you to show you how that's 
most likely, that's not God's end game. That's not the heavenly game. That's not the more godly game. That might be some of your game. It might just be a game. But we like to call things home on earth, and I'd like you to move away from that in your mind. Okay, I'm not going to labor this point any longer. Um, I think you understand. So, what this should do in us, if we understand this, heavenly citizenship, exiles here for the next 70 years, what if we will only see Jeremiah 11 to 13 after 70 years? Then it means it's a heavenly reality, isn't it? I just think too many Christians are wanting that heavenly reality right now. And it's not like that. It wasn't then and it isn't now. And I'll show you why that's very dangerous just now. But what, what understanding this should do in us is there should, there should be a real distancing from the place we're not citizens of. The ways of this place that we're not citizens of. There should be a distancing from that in our hearts. Where we look to the ways of this place and say, this is not me. This is not the way I do things. This is not the way I live. We live differently. Our nation, our citizenship has got different laws. It's higher laws than what I find here. The social norms, whatever it is. There's a distancing from each wage, but then there, there is a greater, there's an even greater engagement than what they, if, if you really understand this, there should be a greater engagement with the city than, and with the place you're at than what there would have been if you just engaged it for having its ways. Okay, so there's a, there's a greater distancing, but then there should also be a greater engaging as the agents of heaven in this place. You with me? There's a distancing and there's an engaging. While that's happening, there is a groaning. There is a real groaning inside of you for the fact that stuff is broken here. And that I don't really want to be here. But I do, as much as I want to go home, I do want to see these things change as well. So what do I really want? Sometimes I just want to go home and say stuff this. And other times I'm like, God, keep me here. So it's okay. I can, we can work longer to make more of this heaven. So there's a groaning because of this distancing and engaging that happens at the same time because of a real love that we have for our God who wants to redeem all things and for those he wants to redeem because we get his heart all the more, feel it for others and so we can't run away because we love. So we engage because we love. We groan because we want to go home. We distance ourselves from the momentary joys we see happening all around us. I mentioned earlier, but Jordan, oh not Jordan Peterson, Eugene Peterson, um, Freudian slip, isn't it? What's been on my YouTube feed? So, Eugene Peterson speaks about pastoral engagement and when we speak with others and work with other people and he says that we should at the same time have a, have a, have a, have a, a, a reverence and an awe for the glory of God that's hidden within every person to the point that we should take our shoes off in the glory of God that's hidden in each person. At the same time, we should despise and hate the idols that we see them holding on to. And if we can hold those two things in perfect tension, then we can do pastoral work well. Um, and I think it's the same for the city. I think if you, you can see the glory and the beauty of God in this place, for sure, without a doubt. You can see people that are beautiful, that does amazing things. You can see the mountains, the ocean, the, the store. You can see God. You can behold the glory of God in this place. And you can also despise and hate the idols that you see everywhere in this place place that's causing destruction and chaos and I think those we should hold in perfect tension to to enjoy and engage the beauty and the glory of God that's in this place that he created that's within within um, culture and people there's so much beauty you know the heavenly city one day all the cultures of heaven it says all the kings of the earth will enter but no unclean thing will enter which means all these cultures will come like next week when we have our Burundian friends with us. It's more, it'll be more like heaven. 
but no unclean thing will be in there. So there is that that is here that we should engage with, and that's God, and that's beautiful, and we can learn from, and we can experience while distancing ourselves from its ways, while engaging it for God's purposes, while groaning, because we're actually we're not, we're not satisfied here. And you're not going to be satisfied in Amsterdam or Toronto or Bloemfontein. You're going to be sat As a child of God who's been born again, you'll be satisfied only in Christ. His presence in you is the only thing that will satisfy you. So don't run for something else. Run to Jesus. So maybe you should make a switch towards this. Now, if we don't have this identity well established, what will inevitably happen is you will long for the things of the earth. You will long for things. You'll not have your, your, your mindset on things above, as the scripture said, but you'll have your mindset on things below. When your identity is not fixed, as we just said, then you will long for things of the, the earth. And that is what happened to the exiles in Babylon. And the two things I want to speak about now that, that we read about there is firstly the false prophets in Babylon and how we relate to that and then God's promises in God's time. But predominantly about false prophets in Babylon. If this is not anchored, your identity is not established, verse 8 and 9 says, Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. Take a minute, just read it again. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. So false prophets can, in this environment can go to two directions. You, you can either have those that prophesy that we should fight the system with war and and we, like the Jews still believe with war, we will, we will beat the Romans, let's say. So the Messiah will come and he will be on a horse and we will beat the enemy. And so the, the false prophets will either say we should fight against them, have our revolts as they were um, in, uh, while Israel were under captivity always. Or on the other hand, we should adopt this way of life. And then there comes a third and very destructive way in which the prophet spoke. And that Ezekiel 14.4, and this portion speaks to, Ezekiel 14.4 speaks about the fact that God says, I, God, will answer you according to the idols in your heart. Hey, God, can I please do this? Can we please go to that? Can we? do this? Can I take a sabbatical and just do the world? I want to see the old Can I? Da, 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 da. God will, if there's an idol, an idol is the thing you want more than God, okay? So you, it doesn't help you tell yourself, I want God more than anything, but then you don't. So it's God saying you can have it. He will say you can have it. Sometimes I, had, I just, I feel God says this is okay. And you think that that's a word, that's not a word from God that says this is the will of God that might be, very well be this thing that I just really want and it's deep down in my heart it's got nothing to do with the kingdom of God that's how you'd know it's got nothing to do with the kingdom of God but a lot of what you want and then you feel God says it's okay and then you go off in this weird in this weird pursuit of where you're with Jesus but doing all these things has got nothing to do with his kingdom or looks like the way Jesus lived and th that's exactly the kind of prophecy that it speaks about here yeah, it says do not listen to the dreams that you encourage the prophets to have so here it's not only God saying well listen as an Ezekiel who wrote in the same time period I will allow you what you really want so you can see and experience that it's not the life that I wanted for you um, here it says do not listen to the dreams that you encourage them to have they pre what did the people want in that instance a quicker release from exile. We don't want to wait the 70 years. We want someone to come with a word that we will be released quicker. Huh? Those are the kind of prophets that run around in today's world the whole time on YouTube. 
I'm prophesying these big things and these awesome things and these things are going to happen and I see this coming and there's this wave of revival that's going to hit this place and that's going to happen and this thing. And, and then five years later you think, did any of that happen? I mean, you have to have a wonderful imagination to see half of the things that was apparently prophesied to keep people encouraged in the moment. And it's, it's seemingly good things sometimes, like being released from Babylon so we can worship God again in Jerusalem. It, it's got this, it seems godly, but in, in Jeremiah 28, Hananiah the prophet, God put Hananiah the prophet to death because he said in two years from now, God's going to do a mighty work and you'll be released. That was not the word of God. That was him saying what the people wanted to hear. The word of God says 70 years. And even to those who were living there then, he said 70 years. How encouraging is that? Well, not that much if you're looking for stuff in the flesh. Not that much if you, if, if you want things in this life to work out better. That's not encouraging. Because I'm going to be dead. So I have to look for another prophetic word that's going to say, it's not 70 years. It can't be 70 years. I want to have a great life. And that word seems like death. So they couldn't have it, so they found prophets who would say what they dreamt for them to say. You know, I sometimes feel, as a preacher who must say things that I, I sometimes feel encouraged to dream about that I, I can tell you to enjoy your time in Cape Town and be on the lookout for the next great thing that God has for you. That's kind of the thing I feel led to dream about. To tell you like, oh man, Cape Town is so awesome. Love Cape Town. Love the people. Love, oh, it's a cool. You're going to love it here with us. La, 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 la. And then, oh, God has got such great plans for you. Just look for the next thing. That's the lie I feel, often feel encouraged to proclaim and have to keep myself from pr proclaiming that I've identified I'm just telling you. And that is pretty much Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13 out of context. So once again, we have to have our heavenly, we have to have our heavenly citizen hats on, really. We have to understand that when we're in exiles on this earth and we're not here to have our best life now, but we're here to have life with God now. And that I can I even don't want to say this, but it is awesome. <laughs> but that's not what it's about. Let God make it awesome if he so wants. But maybe you will be sawn in half, and that's not so awesome. But that can also be God in this life. So we can't say it will be awesome because of Jeremiah 29, 11, or 13. Sometime in my life, things are going to be awesome. No. Sometime hereafter, for billions of years, if there's even going to be years, things are going to be awesome. Right now, you can have the peace of God presence of God you can have the fullness of God you can have lots of wonderful and beautiful things but you cannot have a pursuit after having a great life as soon as possible because that'll end up in that'll leave you having God allow you and prophets prophesying the wrong things to you like Hananiah did so the question here is what do you yearn for do you yearn for the same things that your unsaved friends yearn for? I know this message is intense. But you know me. What do you yearn for? Do you yearn for the same things that your unsaved friends yearn for? Do you speak about the same things with the same excitement? Just test your heart. It's not condemnation. It's an invitation to come closer to Jesus and to align to his ways. To say, yes, Lord, let me follow, let me follow, because there's life in that alone. If so, then, well, maybe you're of those that could say, oh, Lord, I've been dreaming about things that I actually know I don't want to dream about. I often do. I go down rabbit holes in my head. And then it's easy to shake it off and to say, I repent of that. Lord, change my heart. I don't want this. Maybe you do not want to. Maybe you feel like in your heart you want what you want. And, you know, of course, of course God is a God who wants to give you what you want. And da, 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 da. And so 
if that's the case, then I would love to minister with you afterwards, make a meeting with me in the week, we can talk about that. But there's probably a gospel, we should probably then go back to the gospel and speak about the gospel and understand that Christ gave everything for you. And the only real response to that, that only comes through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, you can't manufacture it, but is to declare and to say that I give my whole life back to you. And so I have no rights. I want to follow. So what do you yearn for? What might be the idols in your heart that you want prophets to speak into? What are the things you don't want to be true? What are the things you want to, ha- to be true? And ask yourself, are these things in line with what the Word of God says the will of God is? Often you hear people say, like, yeah, but God also wants you to have a nice life. I'm like, yeah, but that's nowhere in the Bible. So allow God to make you have a nice life if He so wants. Some lives might be nicer than others. I don't know. That's not the point. The point is to follow Him in that. So false prophets in our day, just as a few of them, I want to point out specifically some of it I haven't mentioned now. But the first one is, and I'll be quick, I'm not, not I'll be scared of a long list, but. Jesus and the life of my choosing, that's major, okay? Love Jesus, love everything, but man, I've got my own thing going. And you can say you don't, but a lot of people just do. You've got Jesus, but then just a hell of a lot of stuff that you've got also. That's nothing to do with him. So you want him, so everything's fine with him. You do enjoy the whole vibe, but it's not all your life is about. Really, my life can't just be all about Jesus. That's something your heart can prophesy to you it's not jesus and life it's jesus is life and your life we you have to decide if he's lord if he's not lord of all he's not lord at all but that's what the world's preaching prosperity the word of faith movement wrongly wrongly applied you can have whatever you want, just claim it by faith. Jesus became poor so you can become rich. <clears throat> yep. It's a lie. He provides, yes, he blesses, yes, more than what you would think. And I can tell you stories for days about how he provides and blesses. But he does not, he, he's not, he does not set up a world where we can just name and claim stuff and pull them down from heaven um, and have what we want. That is not from God. Because how does a life crucified then say, well, well, actually I'm just here to have whatever I want. The prosperity gospel is a small part of the gospel. It's not the whole gospel. Be very aware of it. uh, Aware of it. Your best life now, the great idol, it's this twist of a theology that says, well, to follow God, to follow Jesus is the best thing you can do and the best outcome for your life, which means that God wants the best thing for you, which means you can desire and pursue whatever you want as the best thing for you. So it's just mixing the whole thing up. Yes, whatever God wants is the best thing for your life, but allow him to choose that because he's the good father and not you. Dream big. Even in church, we would say this. And it came, it's a dangerous thing to say because some of us might ha- not have the kind of calling that we might think is big. So if you're always going to be dreaming big, then what if what God wants you to do doesn't look big? You're always going to feel like, oh, my life's not worth it. What if, if Jesus is really enough, you don't have to dream big, you can be obedient. That was a big thing for me because I was raised to dream big. In God, we're going to change the world. That's an idol. You have to lay that down. I almost said Ben. (laughs) But (laughs) you have to lay these things down so that you can just be obedient and live the life that God has assigned. If it's big, it's big. If it's small, it's small. But we can't all be Billy Graham. Universalism is the other one that says all roads lead to heaven and one day we'll all end up there. We will not all end up in heaven. That's how it is. All roads does not lead to heaven. Jesus is the only way. DEI, what does that stand for, all you, all you corporate guys? 
diversity, equity, and inclusion. I hope it, it doesn't hit South Africa as hard as it's hit other parts of the world. But it's 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 a uh, we are called into to identify with Christ and to find identity in that and to find unity in identity in Christ through our our diversity. Yes, unity in Christ. Diversity, equity, inclusion is a pseudo thing that the world says. Well, let's just respect what everyone wants and have them have their box and we pretend to tolerate everything and everyone tolerates everything and then we include. Inclusion is not God's game. Unity is his game. Becoming one is his game. So this is a very, very dangerous thing um, where the world also wants us to start tolerating things and keep things under one umbrella where God is calling us um, out of that false unity into unity with Christ. Then famous for J Jesus. Man, I struggle with so many. I don't know about you, but worship videos on YouTube and uh, like <laughs> flat cap and cool shoes, celebrity preachers and worship leaders who make a career out of it and you think it's so awesome and so cool and they've got this. Just, I'm not saying everything that, I, th I think m most of you can discern something's not right. It's just so much about how cool you look. It's a dangerous thing because it preaches to us. You should also look that way. You should also try to be that. And I know what that feels like. It feels like a hell of a lot of pride and a hell of a lot of hiding behind my own hurt and putting something else on but not Christ to fix that. So beware of the influence of that thing because it's a worldly influence. And the last thing that the world is preaching and a lot of the church too is that there's no such thing as sin and hell. There is such a thing as sin and that's what separates us from God and will cause us to end up in um, eternal damnation unless we understand that Jesus died to pay the price for that and faith in him then has your price paid in full so that you can be with him forever um, but we can't chuck out the horse's realities because it soothes, it soothes in the moment so those are some of the things I think might be from the false prophets um, that we should be aware of false prophets in Babylon now it seems um, Let's just read verse 10 and 11 and continue to the last part of the message. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to you and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. God has God incredibly good plans for us. We should be very careful about wanting those plans to materialize in this lifetime. Are you willing to not have a good life? but follow Jesus and see him move in and through you your whole life and not have any, I don't know what you would call a good thing in your life, but to have it with him in eternity. That's what he's calling us to. That's what the gospel is calling us to, to lay down our life, to deny ourselves daily and to follow him. When the 70 years are completed, remember those were the 70 years. If seven years are completed, you're dead. That's horrible. But well, what if there is eternal salvation? That's billions and billions of years. What if I tell you you're going to go through hardship today and for the next 50 years you'll have a wonderful time? What will you do? You will gladly suffer. <laughs> well, it's, it's better than that, isn't it? in this lifetime and for those who've been following a long time can testify to the fact that it's not that bad it's really quite amazing to walk with them and let go of everything that you thought you wanted
So he's got good plans for you, but they happen within, within his time and not your plan. Our focus is to please him, to follow him. The good father will focus on the good plans he has for you. And many people I speak to, they're just so focused on making good plans for their life. Most people I speak about is most Christians are busy working out a good plan for their life. What's going to be our next move? What's going to be the next best thing we can do for our life? Because I'm so excited for my life. What's my next best thing going to be that I'm going to move towards? What's those? Because as Jock said, those dreams that you don't tell anybody in church about, but they're way down there, those things are always going to drive you. The things you really want will always drive you towards your next step. And in church, the way... We as leaders see that they play out is that people play church, church, they're excited about everything, and then one day they come to you and say, listen, we've actually been thinking about the other thing, this other thing for a long time. We've made this decision, and it's already settled, and we're, we're, we're gone. You're like, what? I thought we built kingdom together. I thought this and this and this. And, that. and you realize, and you can discern, oh, there's been something brewing for a long time, and you've always been petting this thing maturing this thing of your life that you've always wanted to have realized. And as followers of Christ, we have to deny ourselves daily if we want to follow him fully. Okay. So, in conclusion... I hope that you can ask God to help you identify as being an exile on this earth. I hope that you can start identifying some of the false prophets that might be ministering to some of the idols in your heart you might be at risk of. And I want you to understand that God's plans for you are better than what you could ever imagine. But the way they're going to play out and the timing thereof is in his hands and not in your hands. Let's just close our eyes. I think some of us might be convicted by this word and really want to respond to God. Others of us might be offended at this word. The people were very offended with Jeremiah as well. He was jailed for this, actually. For daring to say this, he was jailed. But it happened as he said. I just want you to take 30 seconds and ask the Holy Spirit what's the thing he wants to do in your heart this morning. And then when you feel you've got something, maybe you've got something already, you're already working on it. But when you've got something that you feel the Spirit is wanting you to deal with this morning, I want you to raise your hand. I'm not going to call anybody forward right now. I just want us to be intentional about engaging the Holy Spirit now to hear what is the thing you want me to engage now. And then I want you to put up your hand and keep it up if you've if you've got that thing.
I want you to have a conversation with God about that thing. Now, I want you to name it, whatever it is, just between you and him. You can put your hands down. You've got that thing now. I want you to take hold of that thing right now. And as the worship team comes to the front, please, I want you to have a conversation with God about that right now, you and him. So we're going to just engage a time of worship where I want you to be in God's presence, continue the conversations with Him, or worship Him with your whole heart. Um, but me and Jacques and um, a few of the other leaders, small group leaders, would you please just be in the front towards my left, your right. I just get the sense that some of you need to shake stuff off, like out of your head, out of your, um, off your shoulders, whatever it is, but it's, it's these, 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 uh, might be the idols in our hearts, might be thoughts plaguing us that wants to trick us into believing and also, also going for some of these idols in our hearts, but I just want us to confess that, confess them and to shake it off this morning and say, I, I, I choose against this idol that is wanting my attention. I choose against this thing that I've always set before me as a hope, as a desire that I do not think is God. So we want to pray with you. While we worship now, I want you to come to the front and to just, con to just pray. While you pray with us, you're just going to confess those things and shake them off. And we're going to pray with you and make a, make a stand over that this morning. So worship team, would you lead us into a song? You can remain sitting, you can stand, you can worship, you can be with God. I ask that we just uh, honor this uh, space. I will close the service in due time. But just honor this space, be with God. And if you need to respond and pray with someone this morning and shake off some of those idols in your heart, please come to the front.